Hello, everyone. Welcome to the lab session on the Pulse trading strategy. So specifically, we're going to talk about how to implement the Pulse trading strategy, perform the series of tests, and uh, illustrate how to generate the trading signals. So let's get started. Uh, here we have the collab session. So first, we install the Wi-Fi NAS to facilitate uh, the uh, retrieval of the data sets. Uh, stock prices in particular. And then we're going to import these packages. So specifically, uh, we are going to use the ADF, the augmented digger for the test, to test if two assets are uh, co-integrated, right? So that resulting uh, spread is a, is a stationary. And then uh, we're also going to use the, the simple linear regression model to uh, calculate the spread. All right, so let's get started. First, uh, let's talk about stationarity. Um, so here um, I have a function that's generates, uh, uh, that's extracting the, the mean and uh, the uh, standard deviation, right? So we go into our specification and then uh, generate a random sample. So this is a run normally distributed random samples based on the mean and the standard deviation. So we, uh, for example, passing the zero and one, which is our standard normal distribution we generate one sample, right? And then we're going to do this for multiple times. Uh, specifically, we're gonna generate uh, 100 samples for for three different series. So this different series uh, will consist of uh, uh, different mean and standard deviation. For example, for the first series, we call it stationary, right? So in this case, we're generating 100 points based on the same distribution, right? Um, however, for the second series, we change the mean every time. So it's going to be uh, gradually increasing for each uh, iteration. And then for the third series, we're going to change the mean and the standard deviation square. So it has a, a larger and a larger standard deviation. And next, next, we plot uh, these three series uh, in one graph. So here we have the blue as the stationary series. And then we have two different uh, non-stationary series. And it's obvious that the third the series with the changing the set division has a higher uh, fluctuations right, as the iterations uh, proceeds. All right, so let's uh, uh, test the stationarity uh, using the uh, ADF, uh, the augmented ticker fuller function, right? So it's AD fuller. Um, so we we'll just pass in the, the time series and then apply the function and then extract the p-value. So we have the control here, uh, the evaluation. If the p-value is less than a certain threshold, which is normally 5%, right? Uh, if, it's the, if that's the case, then the series is likely to be stationary. Um, if not, then it's not so stationary based on our defined uh, significance level, right, which is 5%. So putting this function to use, we have uh, the first series is stationary, and then the second, third uh, series are not stationary, and this is by design, right? We have a, a change in parameters. So stationary time series means that the underlying parameters of the distribution, in this case, the main and the set division, do not change across time, right? Okay, so, um, now let's look at uh, how to test for co-integrated uh, assets. In this case, we are choosing Google and Microsoft for this uh, the full year of 2022, and then uh, download their stock prices. So this is our stock price in terms of the uh, adjusted close price. And then we're going to build a simple linear regression model right, by passing the uh, first stock price to Y variable and then the second price stock price to the x variable. So this is a predictor. And uh, we're going to add a, a, a column of ones, which is also the bell streak. So this add the constant of ones to x, and then use the OIS, the ordinary least skills to build a linear regression model. So this is uh, our target, this is our predictor. Uh, fit means that we're going to train the model. And then after training, so the model is trained, so then we use it to predict uh, the for the input data. So these are our predictions, these are where hat. 
right? And then the difference gives us the residuals. So this also this is also the spread we use to generate trading signals. So just now we built a linear regression model. We can uh, check the uh, parameters, which has a constant and uh, a parameter uh, beta. Right? <clears throat> Uh, we can also verify if the if the residuals uh, uh, is calculated indeed in the same way. So we can uh, explicitly specify out the form of the uh, linear regression model. Right. So the constant plus uh, beta times uh, x right, is our linear regression prediction. And then the difference gives us the residuals. So we can check if residuals these two residuals are the same by using the equals uh, methods. So they are, they are indeed the same. And then let's test out the stationarity for these two assets. So we apply the, uh, the test, the ADF test to the residuals, check the T test, uh, T statistic and the P value. Right, so the result shows that uh, this is our test statistic, this is our P value. So it shows that these two stocks are co-integrated for this period of time. Um, so there's a slight difference. Okay, so some difference between co-integration and correlation. So in this case, we create two uh, series, right? So this is a, a normal distribution with just a different uh, mean here. So we create 100 points for each series with a different mean, but same standard deviation, right? And we're going to plot out the cumulative sum. So this series uh, move together in tandem. Right, so one move uh, this and another answer is moved together. So that correlation, which can be calculated by using the call function, uh, is very is 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 quite high. It's seven nine nine. However, if we use the the uh, co-integration test, which can be done by using the coint function, the p value uh is, is not very large. So they are not appearing to be uh, co-integrated, so which means that uh, uh, a pair of co correlated sets may not be co-integrated. So they are uh, different concepts, and their calculation is also different. <clears throat> and this is because at the end of the day, correlation measures the, the linear co co correlation based on the cons construction, based on the definition of uh, uh, the correlation here. All right, so let's uh, look at how to implement the pulse tree in the end-to-end uh, in -end fashion. So in this case, we have the space of uh, uh, symbols for a few stocks, right? We download them in terms of the adjusted closing price. This is our price. And uh, we're going to select the pair to uh, the co-integrated pair, right? So to start, we just uh, use the combination function because we need to generate the unique set of uh, all the different pairs, right? The combination help us to do that. Then for each pair, we're going to apply the same test. In this case, using a threshold of 10%, so uh, a bit more lenient. And then uh, I'm going to use a for loop to test out the, the uh, uh, significance, the p-value for each pair. So first we just uh, take out the corresponding uh, data frame, apply the test using coin to function, and then extract the p-value, see if they are co-integrated. In this case, uh, the, result, the result shows that only Google and Microsoft uh, passes the 10% threshold test. Uh, so next, we, we uh, repeat the same procedure. So we just extract these two uh, stock prices, get a constant, build a linear regression model, and then gets the residuals, uh, which we call spread in this case, right? So it's essentially the residuals, and then we plot it out. So these are the daily spread time series for these two stocks. Um, so because the, the stocks, uh, the spread is uh, is not is, is uh, uh, there are ups and downs, and it makes it a bit difficult to say what is uh, uh, what is a big deviation. So we have a big, big deviation here but we are not sure how big it is because uh, different stock prices have different uh, units, right? So their scales are also different. Um, so it's good to standardize to a Z score 
at least on that certain uh, benchmark. So in this case, we um, uh, we illustrate what is a z-score. So so here, uh, we just skip the codes. Essentially, you know, I'm plotting a normal curve. This is a, this is also called a bell curve, right? So here, the value corresponds to the familiar one point nine six, which is the two standard deviations right, for the normal distribution. And here is 5%, which means the area on the curve, which is the shaded area, is 5% of the uh, of the total area. And uh, here is the same. So typically in the hypothesis testing, so if the probability falls into this region, that means the probability of this occurring is very small. And under the now uh, uh, hypothesis, uh, this uh, would represent the probability of uh, of the now hypothesis being true, right, which is very small. And if that's the case, then we can reject the now hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis. Right? So that's why we have the threshold p value. So if the p value is uh, less than this threshold, then we uh, reject it and we would uh, favor the alternative hypothesis. So next, we convert it to a z score by standardizing the this spread. So the standardization goes by uh, goes by this way. So we use the rolling mean and standard deviation. And so here we have the uh, uh, sample size and the window size for the rolling window. And then we use the rolling function to calculate the rolling mean and standard deviation. So these two serves out as our benchmark for the, the current uh, spread, right? So it also could be understood as the predicted uh, mean and spread, and mean and standard deviation. And, and we're going to measure the unit distance between the current daily spread and the predicted, right, the expected uh, spread. And we're going to measure in terms of how many how many standard deviations uh, is this uh, deviation. <clears throat> right, so this is our z-score, and we can plot it out. So we have a, a z-score here. And again, it's supposed to be following the uh, uh, normal distribution. Okay. So next, we remove the initial days because you see uh, initial days, we do not have any uh, value because of the rolling uh, window. Then uh, here is just to extract the first valid index and then start from there. So we have uh, data from day one onwards. And then we can formulate the training strategy. So here, we, as we covered in the previous lecture, we need uh, two thresholds. So one is for entry, one is for exit, right? And then uh, we're going to maintain two uh, lists that represents the daily positions of these two stocks. Okay, so now we're going to look through each day. So each day, we're going to identify uh, what's the position for each stock should be. So what's the day? Should we go long, short for position for stock one and stock two? Um, our threshold, uh, uh, our conditions uh, is intuitive. So in this case, first, if the z-score, if the current z-score is less than the negative entry threshold, which is, for example, it could be negative two, right? So if it's uh, very, uh, very big in the negative direction, and also we do not have a long position, right? So we, we do not have any position uh, before then we're going to long stock one and short stock two, right? Long means uh, one and short means negative one. And so this represents the situation when the deviation is very big. Um, so the stock one is very um, undervalued, right? Underpriced and stock two is overpriced. That's where we go long for stock one and uh, short for stock two. Um, we can do this for the other direction, right? So if uh, this is score is very big, in the positive direction. Now we're going to short stock one and long stock two. Um, so this is our safety, uh, uh, our safety measure comes in, right? So if the difference, if the z-score in terms of absolute value is within this uh, threshold, that means the spread is gradually converging, uh, coming back to its long-term equilibrium. Then we exit the position by starting to zero. Right? And then, uh, uh, so that's the second case. If that's in between, then we maintain the position. So by overriding the 
current position with the previous state's position. So maintain what is, uh, maintain the existing position. All right, so uh, with this uh, strategy formulated, then we can calculate the baseline uh, uh, stock returns. So we first get the, the stock return and the data prices for the first few days uh, onwards. I calculate the percentage change. This is our daily simple returns. Then uh, I will go to shift the position. So this is because, uh, so this is shifting um, uh, in, so in, in one day before, right? So shift one day before, which means that the position we formulated today can only be used to test, to calculate the profits for tomorrow, right? So we cannot uh, use today's position to calculate today's profit because we just formulated. Right, so there's a one day lag. So, uh, in other words, this is our uh, buy and hold profits, right? And we're going to say if the profit is positive or negative depending on our position for the stock, right? So, this is the same uh, way we calculate the trend falling strategy's uh, profits. And if it's uh, only, then we feel an with zero, which means uh, no change in the position. Right, so we're just going to add these two stocks uh, profits uh, together. Uh, this is our terminal total returns, and then uh, we convert it to a one plus R, compound them to get the cumulative returns. So these are cumulative return plots. Uh, we can extract the last period, which gives us the terminal return, convert it to uh, the simple return format. Uh, so which is uh, fourteen percent return, uh, not a bad uh, result. But again, the assumption, there are a lot of assumptions here, but this uh, tutorial shows you uh, one way how to uh, formulate the strategy, uh, calculate the the the, uh, the returns. All right, so that's it for this view, and uh, thanks for watching.